This topic came from kind of a questionnaire that we had in our last newsletter on potential topics we were thinking about. And so thank you for everyone that chimed in. This topic received the most votes by far, and we kind of thought it'd be a fun way to look at a few areas within the annuity landscape that may provide some value to clients. And I want to highlight that word, you know, may there. This is anything but a blanket recommendation for these products. You know, in fact, very few of our clients, you know, actually own these. However, they have a fit for some clients, and we see these as very viable options in some cases. And so the goal of this is just to make sure you know about these options, hopefully understand them at a basic level, know what might apply to your situation or what interests you, and know that we're here just for you to reach out to for more details if, if you want to explore any further. And then just, of course, as a reminder, we're a fee-only firm, so we do not get any commissions from any recommendations we make on any insurance products or anything else. And so last caveat is um, there's obviously a, a lot of bad products out there in the annuity market, or maybe better way to say this is that a, a lot of annuities are sold to people that probably uh, don't need an annuity. And we're not really going to touch on that for this webinar because I could probably talk about, <laughs> about that for an hour or so. Uh, but just wanted to throw that out there that, um, again, it's not a, a big recommendation for annuities for everyone. Um, and maybe just to kind of get started here with that in mind, we'll look at the first type of annuity we're going to look at today. And that's a single premium immediate annuity, or just called a SPIA for short. And so what we like about these is that they're very straightforward, simple to understand products. SPIAs work by an investor turning over a lump sum payment today, and that for future income at regular intervals, usually a monthly payment. And SPIAs have a couple options uh, payment options that you'll have to choose from. There's the life payout option, and this just means monthly payments that you get for the rest of your life. This is effectively buying a pension. Um, or there's also what's called period certain, which is just monthly payments made for only a specific amount of time, usually a multiple of five years. So it does not pay for your whole life. You're just guaranteeing a payment for a certain time frame. And so what does a SPIA look like in the real world today? Just as a disclaimer, again, I, I ran these numbers a week ago, March 15th of 2024, in case you're watching a recording of this, uh, because these numbers can and do change every day. Uh, but first, let's look at just a period certain SPIA. For this example, we're looking at a 65-year-old uh, you know, maybe a recent retiree who's looking to secure a source of income for the next five years to get them to age 70, you know, so they can begin their Social Security at, at its maximum benefit. Um, and just in this situation, they're looking for income of $5,000 per month or $60,000 per year. And since this is a five-year uh, period certain SPIA, this annuity will only pay for five years it will pay out $300,000 over the next 60 months effectively. And this screenshot here is just the results that uh, you will receive if you go through Charles Schwab's annuity calculator online. And this 65-year-old would need to pay $271,000 uh, today to receive that $5,000 in monthly income over the next five years. Again, there's nothing variable or unknown about this. It doesn't matter what the stock market does or the bond markets do over the next five years. When you purchase this annuity, you know exactly what you are going to get uh, in the future. And so what are some of the, just the advantages of these? Uh, ultimately, why these annuities make our list is that they're straightforward and, and very clear with what they provide to investors. You know what you're going to get when you purchase these. Uh, what's very common and just more complex annuities is that there's a lot of misunderstanding on how annuities perform in certain situations. You know, so this is kind of like your index or variable annuities. Um, with these, if you're happy with the number that the insurance company quotes you, you should take it because you know you know what you're going to get. And uh, lastly, I showed that 
you know, a five-year period, certain example here, but there's lots of different options you can do, just about any multiple of five years between five and 25 year. Uh, and then of course, there's a life payment as well. Again, just kind of buying that pension. And then with any kind of fixed income or annuity, there are downsides too. One with SPIAs in particular is that the money is locked up. This is an irrevocable decision. And so you can't take payments for a year or two and then decide you want to get your money back. And so, you know, you just want to make sure you're comfortable and committed with the idea. Uh, most SPIAs do not have inflation adjustments to income either. Probably not a big deal in that last example that we looked at. But if you want a longer payment option or a life option, uh, that's something to consider. At least make sure your other investments have some um, ability to help hedge against inflation. There's technically still some risks with annuities. They're not a complete risk-free investment. You know, I guess nothing really is. Uh, but you're you're dependent on the insurance companies that are backing these. And then perhaps these can reduce some options for, for tax planning. And so just for example, if our 65-year-old in the previous uh, example we looked at used his IRA to buy the SPIA, um, it's going to force 60000 in taxable income on them, maybe take away some other opportunities like recognizing capital gains at a 0% tax rate or doing Roth conversions at lower tax brackets. And just a reason why it might be good to at least get a second opinion before pulling the trigger on something like this to see what um, potential opportunities you're giving up. And so what are some alternatives if you don't want to purchase a SPIA? Or at the very least, how would you go about checking if the payout that you're being offered is fair. Uh, the most basic way to kind of recreate a SPIA without getting into an annuity contract is just a simple bond ladder. I think the concept of a bond ladder is probably pretty generally understood. You know, you're purchasing different investments that mature at, you know, every year for as many years as you want income. Uh, this slide got a little busy with all the information. I'm not going to go through all the details. I wanted to provide uh, some numbers here in case, you know, you wanted to see what, what math was kind of going on behind the scenes. Uh, what I'm showing here is at the very bottom, the amount that you would have to purchase and specific funds that are out there today that are defined maturity bond funds to recreate that SPIA that we just looked at. And I think you know, again, with, with glancing over some of the details here, I think the takeaway is that for a pretty similar amount, about 200, just under $270,000, you could recreate the income that that SPIA uh, annuity was going to give you, again, a very similar amount, maybe a couple thousand dollars less. Um, then what the annuity company was going to quote you. With that comes a little bit more work on your end on just managing this. Um, or, you know, hope you could let your financial advisor manage it for you too, if you'd like. Um, there's also a little bit of an advantage doing something like a bond ladder like this because the money is not irrevocably locked up. And so if, if something happens, you can sell these funds, get your money back, do something else if, if your financial situation changes. But um, just to be fair here, as you start looking at longer and longer payout periods, say 20 years instead of five, like we're looking at here, um, annuities will begin to offer better terms than you can get from bond funds like this. And that's just because you get the added return or the added uh, guarantee that insurance companies can provide uh, because of what's called mortality credits, which is uh, just an effect that you can get a higher return because other annuity holders are um, dying and the insurance company doesn't have to pay them anymore. And so this example is maybe a good comparison for shorter term uh, period certains, but this math probably does not apply as you start looking longer and longer payout periods. And so when does a SPIA make sense? In general, for those that just want a higher amount of fixed income in their plan, uh, these are probably the way to go. You know, maybe you don't have a large Social Security benefit for some reason. You have a higher amount of fixed incomes for, 
or I'm sorry, fixed expenses for some period of your plan or, or maybe your whole plan as well. And you just want to secure a larger amount of, of income there. These can be a great option for that. And then lastly, I use that initial example of a 65 year old looking for income to uh, be able to delay social security until age 70. And that was for a specific reason, you know, regardless of what insurance salesmen try to tell you, social security is really the best annuity out there by far. And so using something like a shorter term, you know, five year SPIA in this case, to allow you to delay social security can make a lot of sense and probably makes a lot more sense than claiming Social Security at 62 and then also needing to buy a SPIA to supplement that little bit lower income. And so SPIAs can be a great tool. Just don't forget to plan around some other options like Social Security that you have available to you. And then maybe just one last point on SPIAs here, but something we have seen come up more recently uh, as just an important example we wanted to bring up, with the rise in interest rates in particular, and just because businesses are trying to get some big pension liabilities off their books, it seems like, there's been an increase in offers to buy out pensions over the last couple of years. And so if you are ready to earn a pension benefit, you might be offered a lump sum where a company is effectively Yep, buying out that pension. You get a big lump sum now, but you do not get payments for the rest of your life. And if you get an offer like this, even if you know you want a pension, it's a good opportunity to kind of plug that lump sum in that they're offering you into a SPIA calculator and see if um, you, know, you can get a higher amount elsewhere. There's no promises here at all, but we have seen instances where you can get 50 or 100 bucks more from that lump sum payment and using that to purchase a SPIA rather than go through the actual pension with your company. And um, so with SPIAs there, that's kind of what we had just to kind of introduce those. The next type of annuity we're looking at is relatively new. It's a pretty niche part of the annuity marketplace. These are Qualified Longevity Annuity Contracts, or QLACs for short. These were just created about 10 years ago and then recently had to change from the Second Secure Act a couple of years ago that made them uh, a little bit easier to use and easier to implement into a plan. And so these are a type of deferred income annuity where you're still putting up a big one-time payment now, uh, but in exchange, that monthly income doesn't begin until a later date. And what makes these in particular unique is that the payments can be delayed until uh, as late as age 85, and you do not need to take RMDs or required minimum distributions on the amount that's in a QLAC. You're limited to uh, only being able to put $200,000 per person in these. That amount is adjusted for inflation, so it'll go up over time. Um, and so you can't kind of do this with, with you know, a million dollar IRA, for example, it can tends to be a relatively smaller piece of, of the big picture. Um, and then, like I said, these are a very small piece of the insurance landscape. Uh, here, this figure at the bottom, they make up less than 0.1% of all annuity sales. And so, you know, why are we even taking our time to discuss these? It just so happens that these can be one of the best ways to protect a retirement plan from that risk of longevity or outliving your assets. And just to start to show why... Here's an example of a 65-year-old male today who wants to purchase a $200,000 QLAC and have the payments begin at age 85. Uh, I'm using 65 here again just to try to keep consistent, but there is, you know, these are something that can be available at uh, really about any age, I guess maybe not past 85, but uh, there is no limit, it doesn't have to be 65, just so we're clear. Uh, but again, just for kind of continuity in this example, this person could pay $200,000 today and then beginning at age 85, they would get a payment of just over $10,000 per month. So $120,000 per year. This 
payout comes with, you know, no kind of minimum payments or guarantees. So if you die at age 85, uh, you're not getting a big lump sum back. There is an option here to kind of guarantee at least your initial principal, uh, meaning, you know, your heirs or beneficiary would get at least that 200000 back. That would reduce your payment to about $8,500 here. So you get about $1,500 a month less if that's something you really want to protect against. Uh, but right away, you know, I hope you see that these have the potential to really guarantee large amounts of fixed income later in life. If you're comfortable with that trade-off of, of, you know, potentially passing away early and not uh, getting this money kind of into your estate. And so what are some of the pros and cons of these? Again, these are annuity contracts. They provide you with a very known return. There's no uncertainty on these about, you know, what the stock or bond market has to do to give you that income. And then, uh, you know, I think the pro that's most important here is that there's almost no better way to protect against longevity and outliving your assets than a QLAC. We're going to look at some specific numbers in a second, but if you somehow knew you were going to live to be 100 years old, the math behind QLACs just makes them incredibly tough to beat. And so... Uh, now, just before we get into some examples, there are a few potential drawbacks, just to be clear. These are irrevocable contracts as well. Once you send over that $200,000 or whatever amount you choose, there is no getting it back, uh, you know, until you live long enough to get your payments started. And that means if you pass away earlier, these investments will end up producing, uh, you know, low or poor return compared to if you just kept it invested in in your IRA. Uh, there's inflation risks with these like any other fixed income. Uh, like before, too, guaranteed by an insurance company is, is a good thing, but it is not risk-free. And then lastly, uh, you know, you're purchasing these with pre-tax money, so any payments are taxed as income, and so you're going to force a certain amount of taxable income on you later in life and potentially remove some options of taking example or taking advantage of tax breaks for those with lower taxable income. It's not always a downside, but again, just it, it could be for some. And so what's important to consider is knowing the trade-offs you're making with a QLAC purchase. And the alternative is just keeping that money invested and hoping it grows enough to support withdrawals for as long as you live. Just to give you some numbers to see how QLACs compare with just investing in general, here's a scenario where that same 65-year-old uh, invests that 200000 instead, or, or likely just keeps it invested, and begins withdrawing at age 85. And so just to start, we'll assume a 7% annual return on that $200,000. That grows for 20 years and would become about $775,000 in 20 years. They then would begin the $10,000 monthly withdrawals, uh, which would cause their investment account to be depleted somewhere around age 92. That's shown in the green line in this chart here. And then I also wanted to show some variable return just to see how that affects the math here. And so the red line shows a 9% annual return. Uh, that would support similar withdrawals that you could get with the QLAC through age about 101. But just note that you know 9% returns is pretty optimistic and certainly higher than an average retiree portfolio has achieved over long periods of time. And so uh, definitely on the optimistic side for what you might want to plan on. The blue line here is 5% returns, which would give you uh, that same income that the QLAC would pay out through just about age 88. It's just a, about a month or two shy of age uh, 89. I think this blue line might be worth focusing on because today, long-term investment grade corporate bonds have a yield of about five and a half percent. And so getting anything much more than about five and a half percent today means at the very least just taking on more risk than you uh, would with an annuity contract. But kind of think of this as your break-even for a 65-year-old 
delaying income until age 85, it's probably, you know, late 80s, early 90s is, is the break even just to have in your mind. And so right away, you see that if you want to protect against longevity, right, if you knew you were going to live until 100 years old, uh, QLACs are really great uh, just because we would never, you know, want to plug in a 9% or even higher annual return for a for a retiree for the next 40 years. It'd just be a little bit uh, tough to, uh, you know, bank on. And so these QLACs can provide that return for people that live that long and so are a great way to protect against longevity. Uh, the third bullet point here is just another benefit worth mentioning. And it's very common to, you know, retire at 65 or whatever age you retire and feeling a little nervous to spend money. It's hard to com comfortably spend early on when you just don't know how long you need to preserve your assets for, right? Uh, you know, do we need this nest egg to last for 20 years or 40 years? And QLAX can give you that confidence to spend early on. Because you know you're already, you know, you've already secured some amount of income for later in life. So now your planning window has shrunk. You know, we set aside money in a QLAC to create fixed income that that meets your goals at age 85 and later. Now we just need to make sure that what's left, you know, is lasts you from now until age 85 or whenever the QLAC income kicks in. So it can help reduce some tail risk of the plan, uh, but you have to be comfortable with the costs here. If you pass away before a certain age, you're likely going to you know, either leave a lower inheritance or just have a lower return on your money than if you kept it invested. One last example I just wanted to introduce here is how a QLAC can compare to one of the most popular forms of long-term care insurance, uh, which is called a hybrid long-term care policy. With a hybrid long-term care policy, you're making a big payment up front to secure income in the future in case you need long-term care. These policies get really complex. I'm showing some details here of a policy we just saw a couple months ago for a 65-year-old male, uh, but maybe just at a very high level, this policy required a, a payment of $153,000, and in return, it would pay uh, ultimately a payment of about $10,800 per month for someone age 85 who was in long-term care. And uh, so a pretty close payment to what we we're looking at with that um, QLAC a bit ago. And the policy, as all long-term care policies sold today do, has a maximum benefit amount. Uh, you know, there's some kind of cap in what they're going to pay out. This one, for example, had a four-year payout. Um, and then again, just to emphasize, this only pays out if you uh, are in long-term care, you know, kind of meet the qualifications to... Um, be able to claim on that policy. And I think this is worth considering a QLAC for instead of a hybrid long-term care policy in some instances, just because when you look at the demographics of who needs long-term care, uh, it tends to be those over age 85. You know, that's about the time that QLACs can kick in for maximum benefit. And then also the big concern a lot of people have with long-term care is is you know, not needing it for one or two years of care, but those cases like dementia, for example, that can lead to many years of very high level, high cost care. This makes up about a third of people in long-term care today. And in that case, you know, the case that a lot of people really worry about and what is the risk for most clients' plans you know, that we see today is just uh, long-term care policies don't help as much just because those payoffs are capped at a certain amount. And so, um, you know, again, we're, we're going through some details here pretty quick. Going through these policies line by line would take quite a while. But just to try to summarize a side-by-side -side comparison, uh, long-term care policies might cost a little less than a QLAC, for the same benefit, but they only pay out in the scenario where you need long-term care. And so that makes a lot of people hesitant to buy this type of insurance because, you know, they don't want to pay into, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars into this and 
uh, be healthy and not get their money out, right? And so the benefits are also capped. And so if you need long-term care for many years, these policies won't fully cover you. Uh, QLAX, on the other hand, pay as long as you're alive. So if you're healthy, you're still getting that $10,000 a month payment in our example. If you need long-term care, you're still alive. And so you're getting that payment, which goes a, a very long way towards paying towards your long-term care costs. And um, so again, I know we kind of ran through this example really fast. Uh, I would just say before you plop down hundreds of thousands of dollars on a hybrid long-term care policy, it's at least worth considering and comparing a QLAC to that because payment amounts can, in, can end up being pretty similar. And so just, uh, you know, maybe ultimately to summarize here, remember that both these products we talked about today, SPIAs and QLACs are insurance. Insurance of any type has some kind of fee to it. When you buy insurance, you are accepting a potential for a lower return in one scenario in exchange for protection against the cost of another scenario. And so it's ultimately it's about determining what risks you're comfortable taking, what risks you don't want to take, and acting accordingly. You know, if you know the prospect of uh, potentially leaving a couple hundred thousand dollars less in an inheritance is not as big of a concern. Uh, compared to what you have about outliving your money, a QLAC is a really great choice. If the potential of you know buying into these though is uh, buying into these and then potentially not seeing a return is something you just can't get over, that's fine too. You just you know you now you're managing a little bit of longevity risk now compared to um, you know someone that did purchase a QLAC. And so, like always, it's worth thinking about the pros and cons. And we're, of course, here happy to help. Uh, we can use some planning software to help you think about risks that are there in your plan and uh, make some recommendations accordingly. So uh, thank you so much for your time today. Hopefully this was helpful introduction just to a couple of interesting options out there today. Uh, please know that we're happy to talk in more detail with you personally, if anything here sounded interesting. Uh, we're here for questions if you have any, and, and if not, thanks again, and have a great weekend.